Our lead-in music for this episode has been composed by Reimagining Dementia, a creative coalition for justice. This episode about Reimagined Dementia was originally released last year and has been reprised to mark the launch this month of the Taking It to the Streets campaign that will see events and activities in many countries around the world designed to shatter the silence about dementia, creatively transform the journey of dementia for everyone, and build a world and systems of care in which diagnosis is not the end of life, but a starting point for joy, humanity, growth, and new possibilities. On today's episode of Dementia Dialogue, we continue the Arts and Dementia series with our special guests, Mike Belleville and Mary Fridley. So one of Mike's accomplishments among all of the other things that he does is being a founding member of Reimagining Dementia, a creative coalition for justice. Uh, and he's currently living well with dementia. Mary is the pro bono director of special projects at the Eastside Institute in New York City and coordinator of Reimagining Dementia, a creative coalition for justice. So welcome and thanks for joining me today. Oh, um, thank you for having us. Yeah. Pleasure to be here, Lisa. Thank you very much. So this series um, has, this Arts and Dementia series has and will be uh, discussing many aspects of the arts, including uh, music, visual arts, uh, performance art. What the two of you are doing and the rest of the coalition is something a little bit different. Can you tell me a little bit about this coalition and, and, and how it all began? Well, I'll fill in some of the facts and figures. I mean, I mean the, the coalition was, in a way, it was born during COVID. And I have I've often said, I have no doubt in my mind that there's a good shot that if it hadn't been for COVID, we, I don't know that we would exist for a lot of reasons, but including that when my um, colleague, Dr. Susan Massad and I, we work with the Eastside Institute, which you mentioned, and we founded a um, conversation workshop series called The Joy of Dementia. And this is actually how we met Mike. It's through, we, we hosted a workshop down in, in Atlanta when the Dementia Action Alliance, which Mike is very active with. And I and Susan, we have a long history as community organizers as activists. So those are kind of the eyes through which we see the world. So when COVID hit and it just immediately became clear what a dramatically disproportionate impact it was having on senior Americans, elders around the world, and particularly people living with dementia. And as the months unfolded, the statistics just got more mind-blowingly worse. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't imagine. And so it was both that that was happening, but the response was also remarkably muted um, on the part of, if you will, the powers that be. Although I think it had a profound impact on the people whose loved ones were you know, in these kinds of homes and institutionalized care facilities that were most dramatically hit. So of course, being activists and being organizers and just being concerned international citizens, we thought this isn't just any moment in our world. This is a, I mean, everybody going through COVID know, now knows it has been a transformational process in ways that are profoundly negative and honestly, in some ways that I think are very positive. And I'm thinking creating some openings that didn't exist before and allowing people to see some things that they just didn't never had seen really in its full magnitude, including a very broken healthcare system. And, and other kinds of activistic kinds of things were going on in our world. So we certainly weren't operating alone, but in a kind of simple minded way, we said, this is, we've got to do something. This is a moment to reach out to all the many incredibly brilliant, wonderful, creative colleagues that we've been meeting through the joy of dementia work who are what I'm coming to call the creative wing of the dementia movement. So we put out a call to maybe 20 or 25 of colleagues who we knew. It was not a comprehensive list. It were people who we had worked with. Fortunately, they responded. We developed a call to action, which you know, I'm sure your listeners will hopefully have access to. And then we formally launched in September um, of 2020. So we're closing in on, well, by the time this airs, I guess we will be over a year old. 
and we've just we thought let's invite anyone and everyone who has a passion for radically transforming the culture of dementia and has some sense that we need to do that broadly speaking through creativity through the arts through performance meaning it, it, it needed to live in that you know in that space in some sense we're one of the things that we've talked about in the coalition quite a bit is we're kind of building the boat as we cross the ocean because in the spirit of improvisation and creativity, we felt like we didn't want to assume we knew what was needed now. So given that radical inclusivity was kind of a centerpiece of the values of the coalition, we thought, no, we're going to work with whoever comes. And, and fortunately, the, the membership is a, a real mix of people. I think Mike can attest to that. It's people living with dementia, young and old, or young and older, care partners, family members, dementia activists, allies, artists, policymakers, anyone in and, and just some individuals who want to make a difference, you know, who, for whom this is important. We all have an equal voice and we're all, I, I hate, I don't want to use the word, you know, saying taken seriously, but I'm not quite sure what else word to use than that because, you know, a, a we may be having a meeting about a particular topic and, you know, the conversation may be going one way, but then someone with a dementia diagnosis may have a different point of view. And then that's talked about and it's like, oh, well, wait a minute, we need to reframe this. So it's, you know, we all have an equal input into what we're doing, how we're going to do it, what's the best way to do it. And, were included, not just in the process, but in the whole development of it. And there's not many organizations out there that do that or do it very well. And we wanted to um, see if we could leverage all of that because there's a lot of wonderful work thing going on. And I'm imagining people are listening, have already listened to your, I don't know where we will be in the course of the thing. <laughs> But people will probably have already heard about many wonderful, from many wonderful people and organizations. Unfortunately, a lot of us tend to work on our own or in silos or without a lot of support. So at a minimum, we wanted to see if we could create a space through which we could leverage our kind of collective resources, experience, success, and then find ways to both project that into a broader stage, have more of an impact in on the conversation around practice and policy, and to do that as creatively as possible as, as we went along. Well, I, I think for me, the thing that really hits home about the coalition is the inclusivity of how everyone has a voice and everyone deserves to be heard. The breadth of knowledge of the people who are included in the coalition is just mind boggling to me. I, I don't want to miss certain individuals, you know, you know, people come to mind, like Mary said, Peter Contos and Jennifer Carson is another individual. And, and there's so many others. And I apologize. I'm not mentioning all of them that they all so deservedly should be mentioned, but it's the fact that, you know, the, the whole creative process of how is it that we want to make change and how can we do it in a, in a positive, impactful way, but in a way that everybody has an equal voice. And especially for those of us with a dementia diagnosis, it's, it is very centered and around, obviously, um, dementia in general, but it the work that the coalition is doing, in my opinion, doesn't have to be just about dementia. It could be just individuals who are, you know, sadly, you know, maybe stuck in a long-term care setting, because I really believe all the work that the coalition is doing could easily apply to them as well, as well as anyone else with a, a, what a, a disability that they may have. So it's not, it is, you know, obviously centered around folks with dementia, but it, it's much broader than that. You know, Mary called me one day and said, hey, we're thinking of doing something like this. What do you think about it? 
you know, really kind of took me back because I, ha- I hold Mary and, and Susan in such high regard for the work that they do, you know, and the thought that, you know, they would want to include me in it. I was just, I was overwhelmed. And so it's, you know, it's like my, my extended family now of everybody that's in this coalition. And I don't know all 500 plus members of them, but <laughs> uh, when we all get together, I can tell you, we have a great time. And there's a, a lot of good work that's already happened, but even more so that's coming down the road. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think people are going to be real excited about what they're going to see and hear from the coalition in the not too distant future. My feeling is the minute you get diagnosed with something, people stop making demands on you. And, and like the whole culture shifts to, oh, let's figure out how we can take care of you. Now, again, I have nothing against taking care of people. Don't get me wrong. And I think it should be, it could be done a million times better than we're currently doing it as a culture, as a society. However, I'm more struck by there's just no demands made. There are no expectations. So if anything, I'm proud of the coalition that we're not just giving Mike and others voices. We're saying, hey, we've got some serious work to do what what do you want to bring to the table? I mean, if you're here, if you don't want to be here, that's fine. I mean, there's a lot of other places to go. You're not trying to be, you know, something for everyone. But I think that's what I feel even more strongly about. And I think that's why I love the arts and creativity and theater and, you know, that whole range of activity, just coming back to the theme of your, you know, podcast that there's spaces that allow people to go beyond themselves. Like I was just watching this incredibly lovely program and um, I will come back to the name of it because I'm not (laughs) remember it, but it's an intergenerational program that brings together, it's out of the University of Miami in Ohio and it it brings together um, college students, high school students, some older, together with people living with dementia or seniors. And it's just a beautiful program, the way they work, the way they developed it. But what I was most struck by, honestly, is watching some videos of the impact on the young people. I mean, and literally they all were saying, it changed my life, I'm a better person. And to me, that's as important in in terms of changing the culture of dementia as can we make, you know, and, and again, there's a billion things that need to be done in terms of care and how people living with dementia are being responded to. And it's wonderful that we can do that and create that in a way that everybody can grow. I think the pain for me that dementia is so sidelined, the topic, is it deprives the rest of us of the joy and the growth and the delight that comes with immersing yourself in a world in which the usual rules just don't apply the ways we know how to connect and communicate just are not as useful. So you're gonna have to call on other aspects of yourself. I mean, I don't know what your experience of that, Mike, is, but that to me, and I I mean, I remember, and I'm I'm slightly giving you a lead in, but maybe you could build on it. Because one of the things you said to Susan and I after the workshop in Atlanta, which I has stayed with me to this day, is you said, why isn't, in this case, we use a lot of improvisational play. That's our particular contribution. But you said, why isn't improvisation or the arts part of every like prescription? Why isn't it part of the prescription you get after you're diagnosed? So maybe you could say a little bit more about that because I, I love that. That has really stayed with me. Where, where it came from was, I remember it was a time my dad was admitted to uh, to the hospital, and sadly he's passed away over a year and a half ago. And he was admitted for um, what they thought was a stroke, a mini stroke. And when they sent him home, of course they sent him home with all the nursing assistant and physical therapy and occupational therapy and all these different types of therapy. Well, at the time, he had also been diagnosed with either mild cognitive impairment or, you know, early onset Alzheimer's. And there was absolutely nothing addressed with that. 
listening to Susan and Mary's program and what they're doing, it just hit me that why aren't, why isn't society using that as a normal quote unquote prescription for a person with a dementia diagnosis? I mean, the emotional impact that what a person is going through. Um, and again, it doesn't just have to be about dementia. It could be just about anything because for me, it all comes down to quality of life. So why would they not want to use what the types of work that they're doing as an example, as part of everyone's normal therapy or prescription, um, if they're going through some type of life-changing event? I mean, one of the things I always like to say is that I honestly believe that the number one prescription doctor should be giving, especially a person with a dementia diagnosis, is social engagement. Mm -hmm. it's not a pill and I hope to, I'm not going to upset too many doctors out there but you know and I do take my medication but the first thing they should be telling people is what they need to do to stay socially engaged and again when I heard you know firsthand that breakout session it just blew my mind because it, for me it was like this should be a part of everyone's normal at home care plan or included in their care plan in some form or fashion because it plays as important a role as anyone else as you know a nurse coming in to check you know a person's blood pressure or occupation you know physical therapy whatever it is who knows maybe we'll start a revolution and <laughs> you know we'll get that included someday but i i honestly believe that it's it, it can be and it, it's it's life altering for folks. I mean, I was diagnosed with dementia younger onset when I was fifty two. Um, well, guess what? That was eight years ago, and I've been blessed that it's, it is a slow progression. It was initially diagnosed as younger onset Alzheimer's. Two years later, they changed it to Lewy body dementia with Parkinsonism. But I even tell my doctors. I honestly believe the reason it's progressing slow is because of the engagement that I'm involved with, that I'm doing, you know, getting connected with reimagining a dementia coalition and of course, DAA and uh, Dementia Alliance International, and, you know, Dementia Mentor. I mean, there's so many organizations of, of course, you know, Louis Body Dementia Association, they have a great online support group but it's staying connected with people. For me, that is the number one thing anyone should be doing. I, I completely agree. And um, I was so excited when I was asked to do this particular podcast series on arts and dementia, uh, because I've seen people who have been involved in the arts and who continue to stay engaged, whether it's in person, whether it's now during COVID, a lot of um, online virtual um, activities, that those are the, you know, those are the individuals that are living well with dementia. And, you know, it, your, your um, idea that this is something that should be prescribed is an absolute necessity, just like, you know, physiotherapy or, you know, anything else that somebody um, would need when they're diagnosed with, an, with a disability or an illness. It's so, so important. So thank you for bringing that up because um, yeah, hopefully this will start a revolution. Absolutely. So just, just for my own clarity, when you meet as a coalition, do you meet around a topic or a project I mean, when we initially start, well, actually, it's interesting you're saying, because I think one of the things we did as a coalition, in, in addition to being absolutely committed to it, being grassroots, to it reaching out as broadly as possible, and also with a particular commitment to, to reaching communities and people who just ordinarily aren't part of the conversation, communities of color, certainly even other countries, LGBTQ communities. So there's that. But then we we consciously didn't set out a list of kind of action items. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to take up. Here are the issues. Now, our call to action, I think, makes it very clear where we're coming from. However, 
we pretty much decided that um, we wanted to get to know who our members were. And also, we, I, I'm just a, I'm not a fan of assumptions. I, I, I believe as an organizer or as a human being, you just don't want to make too many assumptions about how people are even going to respond to what you're doing. Like, I, I would never be arrogant enough to assume just because we thought it was a great idea that everyone else in the world is going to go, wow. But we wanted to get to know our members and genuinely have whatever it is we did, however it is we continue this journey, emerge organically from that. So it's a very emergent process. So when I said earlier that we're building the boat as we cross the ocean, I really do mean that. Like it's a, it's a I know it's a funny statement, but so the first set of gatherings and we would, we've held maybe four or five um, since we started. We hold them about quarterly. We have host about three in any given, whatever the quarter is, the week we decide to do it, we host three because of all the time zones. But really they've been opportunities for, I think Mike and see if you agree with this, I think they're an opportunity for us to play together. That comes closer to, and amongst other things, because it just seemed, I don't know, hypocritical or counterproductive to host gatherings that weren't themselves creative. If, because in a way, my view, and I was thinking about this yesterday and something I was writing, it seems to me that it's, it's important. And I, I, I loved how Mike, like we're very interested in how we're going to do this. So, but the how to me is very important because we want this process to be as creative and life affirming and inclusive and joyful as what we, as the outcomes we hope to create, as the impact we host to have. It's just, it drives me mad that, and a lot of movements have been upended because the organizations and the institutions are top down, they're bureaucratic and they can't respond to to Mike's point, the needs and their, they, in a way, and if I'm not even being critical, but they can't include everyone. They're just not, that's not by design what they're doing. So this is our feeble and hopefully modest attempt to see if we could actually create a social change movement that was itself what it is we wanted to, how we wanted to impact. And we, and really the first three sets of three quarters, three sets of meetings were really playing together and getting to know each other and learning in small groups and large groups, uh, playing together, act, doing creative improvisational exercise. And, but also just getting to know who each other was and what reimagining the dementia even meant. What were people, how did people see this moving forward? More recently we have, um, and out of all of that, and this is very much organic to that process, we're, we're going to launch a campaign in the fall um, around which we're creating a song, which is going to be a wonderful song. It's, we have some very wonderful songwriters involved, including actually mostly Canadian, <laughs> including Simon Law, who's a award-winning, Grammy award-winning producer, songwriter, you know, and so, um, but create a campaign that will hopefully propel both the coalition, place us in the public eye greater, but more importantly, it's, I think it's our next step at, okay, now we have this. Now we need to find some creative ways to reach so many more people. And in part, because again, from our vantage point, I mean, we love the centralized gatherings. They're great, they're fun. We welcome people, we hope you'll come only, but if only because you'll have a nice Zoom experience, <laughs> which is these days, isn't a small thing. And it's reaching out to people about, hey, reimagining dementia is possible. Or in some cases, it might be the first time people are hearing it. Oh, reimagining dementia, huh. I never, I, to me, that's a big deal. I mean, that's kind of how impact starts to happen. People go, oh, reimagining dementia, you know, oh. And in, in this case, and, and we're seeing this in a microcosm in the coalition that people, and I think Mike, you've heard this, folks are ecstatic to find a home who have been kind of working in the wild. So, meaning again, they've just been working alone or they're just not, they didn't know anyone else existed that had these weird ideas about dementia and creativity and that you could actually, not have to be tied to the tragedy narrative, you know, mm -hmm. and on and on. And they're thrilled. I mean, if, 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 if nothing else, I think we've become a home for people who are doing 
radically transformational work, whatever that looks like for them. And it looks a million, it looks 550 plus different ways. We all bring that to them. And it's just such an accomplished group and the projects and the programs and the, and the, you know, the work that they've done. I would, and oh, by the way, the group I was talking about at the University of Miami at Ohio is Opening Minds Through Art. And I was saying to, to the director, Elizabeth Loken, that if her program, just her program, was the norm in, in how we related to dementia and bringing people together, the culture of dementia would transform overnight, as would the relationship, particularly younger people have to aging. Because she's kind of creating now generations of thousands of young people who simply aren't afraid of aging. They're not terrified of dementia. They, they, and, and they, they're just better human beings by their own account. So I feel so strongly that we, we need to come together and leverage all that we've created and built so that all that we've done that's so remarkable begins to have an impact on the broader culture much more broadly, because I agree with Mike. Um, some of my best friends are doctors, but I don't th think dementia lives well in the world of, of the biomedical world. It just doesn't. Mm. I think it, would, it is a creative social experience. And so I think we, I, I think it matters a lot if we can bring this to bear in influencing how everybody is doing their work. But I think one of the things for me, you know, as to, you know, why I think, why is it so important, you know, that we're doing this to begin with? And I think it's to hopefully show others who may have gotten a dementia diagnosis um, that they can still live a meaningful, purposeful life. But it's also to challenge the medical and institutional communities that Mary was talking about and the approaches that they may now be using on how those of us with a diagnosis are even being treated. Another thing is hopefully it's to stop, you know, the fear and the stigma and the feeling of hopelessness uh, that society has ingrained on them, even when they hear the word dementia. And I really believe we need to stop the tragedy narrative um, focused around that word. And what the coalition is doing and what arts is doing, I really believe can have a tremendous role in helping to change that narrative in a positive way. And I think this provides an opportunity for um, including people who aren't necessarily uh, connected with other groups, you know, because during COVID, people have become very disconnected. Um, so this is a way that people can stay connected with their peers and, and with others. So it, it sounds like a great opportunity for those who are looking for, you know, to get involved. Well, I just want to thank, thank you for... Uh, sharing with us more about uh, reimagining dementia and uh, all the work that you're doing. Uh, congratulations! It sounds like it's a, a you know a great success so far, and got lots of members, and hopefully we can get you a few more. Please check out the show note associated with this episode to find out more about taking it to the streets campaign and how you can join in. This episode is re-released under the new partnership between the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario and the Centre for Education and Research on Aging and Health at Lakehead University. The Alzheimer's Society is excited to take on a leadership role in producing and marketing our podcast to strengthen the voice of people with lived experience of dementia. Dementia Dialogue continues to receive financial support through the Dementia Community Investment of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Please continue to follow us on Facebook. Our web address remains DementiaDialogue.ca. You may also reach us through email at DementiaDialogue at ALZON.ca. My name is David Harvey. 